kicking off um, the next series of presentation is the opposition spokesperson and finance, um, Julian Robinson. Um, he is the member of parliament for Southeast, um, Southeast St. Andrew. Um, he is a, a former government minister uh, he, serving in the Ministry of Science, Technology, Energy and Mining. Uh, he helped to develop the cyber strategy uh, for, 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 for Jamaica and has worked across a number of sectors, including at Jampro, uh, managing investment and as a, a consultant. Uh, so beyond being a, a member of parliament, uh, he is, uh, has been a, a management consultant in his own right and has a, a number of experiences in areas of business, uh, finance, investment and promotion that will, will, will be uh, massively beneficial to us as an audience. Um, today, um, he's addressing the topic of developing Caribbean economies in the age of digital. Um, uh, Julian, welcome to, to Digital Housing. Uh, thank you, we, thank you, Javit, and look, good, good afternoon to your listeners and to your viewers as well. I think one of the first things the COVID pandemic has taught the Caribbean, and in particular, the countries that are tourism dependent, is the extent to which our dependence on tourism affected our economies. So I think more than any other um, places within the world, and certainly within the region, those countries that were very strongly tourism dependent suffered the greatest setback in terms of their um, negative economic growth. Our economy in Jamaica contracted by 10%. In other countries, it has contracted by more. And in fact, it has made recovery difficult for many other countries. So I would say for us going forward, when we look at how we can build economies to deal with potential shocks like this. I think it is important to make the investments now in ensuring that you can diversify your economy away from the heavy dependence on tourism. And obviously that is easier said than done, but you know, certainly if I use Jamaica as an example, I think the areas of manufacturing and agribusiness provide a lot of potential for us as a country. And I believe we need to invest more, provide more incentives in those areas so that if we are faced with a shock like this in the future, we won't suffer the same kind of setback. So for me, the government in a sense has to run on two tracks. You're dealing with recovery, which is the immediate and trying to get your economy back on track. But as you recover, you have to build resilience for future shocks. And that resilience to me is finding, identifying sectors which can provide the growth and development. The second thing that I would say COVID has taught us is that we can stay in one country and do business with others in another country. You know, we, so many of us were used to jumping on a plane to go to a meeting, um, going to conferences, going to expos, etc. But we have had to live with using Zoom and other platforms. I mean, and we have been able to survive using these platforms. Not saying they are, they are perfect, but the real point is that the technology facilitates remote working. And in doing that, it presents, in my view, more opportunities for economic growth for us. And so I want to identify two, you know, the business process outsourcing sector, which was one of those sectors which continued to grow in spite of COVID. In fact, it has, um, it has increased in terms of employment and additional investment during the COVID period because protocols were put in early to allow the BPOs to operate, but also they very quickly transitioned to allowing many of their agents to work from home. And in fact, many of them now advertise for agents to actually work from home. 
without coming into an office. So that presents an opportunity as well for Caribbean nations to grow their economies through BPO. And for us, Jamaica is the largest in the English-speaking Caribbean, but we're just scratching the surface. We are, I think, about close to 40,000 people employed. We can easily get to 200,000 and more. But more importantly, it also provides an opportunity to move from what I would call the low value, low um, cost offerings to higher value offerings. So if you can do customer service remotely, it means you can do web design. It means you can do software development. It means you can do accounting services. It means you can do legal services. So for me, this presents an opportunity again for the Caribbean to position itself as an English speaking region, very close to the North America, which still is the largest market for us for for both tourism, both investment and, and trade, and position ourselves in that regard. The second opportunity I think that arises, which I believe still exists, is to promote our destinations as work from home destinations. A lot of companies are allowing uh, their employees to work from home. And once you are somewhere with good internet connectivity, you can work from anywhere. So why not institutionalize an arrangement where you can allow people to come to your country for six months on a special kind of visa? It would have to be something more than just a normal visitor visa. And they would rent a villa, they might rent a house, they may do an Airbnb. And the contribution to the economy of having somebody here for six months is significant. The person who is renting the the place, the, the services like the, 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 the housekeeper, the cook, the gardener, the, 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 the goods that the person would buy at a supermarket, the other services that would be consumed. We could be tapping into a very large market of persons who want to enjoy the sun, sea and sand while being able to do their work at the same time. And I mean, there are examples. I, uh, my wife and I have friends who came to Jamaica for six months, stayed on the South Coast in, in uh, Westmoreland, rented a villa for six months. And, you know, I, won't, I don't know the exact dollar spend, but it's certainly much, much more significant than a tourist who comes here for a week or two, or even somebody who comes here for a day or two. Obviously, with that, it means that your telecoms infrastructure has to be up to stretch. And, you know, many countries have found it difficult, particularly with persons working from home, with students that have to access online school, to have the kind of robust infrastructure which will facilitate all of that. In Jamaica, we are introducing competition in the telecoms market, there are two new entrants which are coming in. They haven't yet launched, but they have been approved and have got licenses. It is important that the governments across the region have a regulatory framework which facilitates competition and which allows new entrants into the market because that's the only way that you can guarantee the types of investments which would facilitate the broadband rollout and the quality of offerings and reducing the price of the, the broadband that is currently being offered, because that still represents uh, an obstacle to many persons who want to have high speed internet access all year round. And all the data shows that nations can grow their GDP if more persons have access to high speed broadband. And if more persons have access to higher speeds broad, broadband, it also increases the rate of growth that a country can have. So I believe in looking at how we respond to COVID, it's very important that we build resilience for sectors which can develop. And in doing so, 
in looking at the digital opportunities, we also have to ensure that we have digital literacy programs that are instituted and rolled out across the, the, the countries. Younger persons who may be more adept at technology will more readily adapt to an environment where you have to do online transactions, banking, utilities, etc. But you also have a large cross section of people who will not be able to adjust. And the reality of many businesses is that they are not going to go back to pre COVID conditions. And what I mean by that is large investments in brick and mortar are not going to be the order of the day. Um, um, you know, banks are scaling down their physical presence. They are pushing people more online. And that is a trend that is going to continue. Utility companies are closing branches and are pushing people online. And we have to position our countries to be able to adapt to that kind of transition, which I believe is going to be permanent, not temporal. So it means that allow investing in digital literacy programs is critical. It's also critical for positioning countries to attract investment in particular areas like the BPO areas, like the KPO areas, because investors look on those indices to determine which country they should go into. So there is also the need for the investments in digital literacy programs across the board to allow those who are not adept at handling themselves in this environment to be able to do so. While we, we, we talk about one, the diversification, secondly, the investment in, in telecoms, um, we, we also have to ensure that we protect ourselves against natural disasters, hurricanes in particular, as a region which is prone to um, these types of events, events which can wipe out an entire economy of a country, particularly our economies which have been very agricultural based. And so yes, it's important to have insurance against these types of events. And um, importantly, while we are in the current environment to ensure that we can survive the the challenges that are brought on by the current environment. Many countries are highly indebted because they have had to provide significant stimulus packages to uh, both businesses and individuals. And I believe it, it requires a collaborative effort as small island, small island developing states to ensure that we can negotiate with our international financial partners that we are not put at a significant disadvantage at the end of these pandemics. We are required to provide the support while ensuring that we can pay the bills and balance our economies. And so it, it will require, in some cases, some level of debt relief or debt postponement, particularly for smaller countries that have been more adversely affected during um the, the the pandemic so i believe their countries have to in a sense you know walk and chew gum you have to deal with the immediacy of the crisis which is still unfolding there is a significant health crisis getting vaccines getting the rate of um your population vaccinated up as we have a challenge in jamaica we're only at eight percent uh, being in a position where you can ensure that you have hospital space, which is adequately staffed and trained. So you can't take your eye off the ball of that because that's the immediate, but you have to build a resilience in the economy so that when you recover, you have a more di diversified economy. You have an economy which can compete with many other economies in the region and the world and you position yourself to take advantage of new types of investments, which I believe will be the order of the day post COVID. So Javet, I would stop there and I'm on to, to questions and comments. Do you think um, 
Caribbean countries on a whole are at a disadvantage vis-a-vis um, -vis developing countries as we seek to use digital for, for more transactions. Yeah, and, we are. Uh, because, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and, and the, the, I, I'll give you two questions and then uh, you can give your answers. The, the, the second question is from one of the earlier panels that deal, deals with payments, uh, where the BOJ is now launching their the, the Jamaica's currency. digital currency. I, I'd love to hear your views on that and the, the ways in which you think um, businesses should be positioning themselves um, I don't know if, if, if you're, you're not the Minister of Finance, but it would be interesting to hear your, your views on that if, if and when that becomes a reality. Well, let me start by saying I think it is a good thing. It is um, mobile money has been a platform that has worked well in many develop, developing countries, particularly in Africa. And I think it provides an opportunity, particularly in Jamaica, where we have a, a very high mobile penetration rate. I think we have to address perceptions of security in, in dealing with these transactions because you know Jamaica uniquely has a very high crime rate. And I think there may be some reservations about you know the having that stored value on an instrument and you know if if that instrument is stolen or lost, how, how that would work. But for me, I, I certainly endorse it, and I think it provides a big opportunity for us as a country. Um, are we at a disadvantage? I think yes, because we start with lower, generally lower broadband penetration rates, which more developing, more developed countries have, much higher, and developed countries have started the process of moving more transactions online and doing more things online. So. Um, yes, we we have a, a somewhat of a disadvantage, but I believe it's something we can we can make up. We can make up because internet um, mobile phone penetration rates are so high, and the mobile phone becomes the main instrument of choice for persons who want to connect to the internet. And that's why I believe countries must have an adequate legal and regulatory framework to facilitate competition in the um, telecom space so that you can get the best offerings, you can get the best prices, and you can ensure that you have the penetration across the board. The big issue for us, and it's not unique to Jamaica, is that broadband penetration is mainly in the urban centers because the telecoms companies make investments where they know they can get the return. But when you have a pandemic and you have people in deep rural areas, particularly um, where students have to access school online, it becomes very problematic. And that requires some level of state intervention to bridge that gap. So for us, it has exposed some of our own challenges, but I think they are not beyond our capacity as a country to resolve. As we look at the, the investment taking place in the BPO sector, um, there, there are certain a number of wrongs along that value chain that we can access. Uh, the, right now, we, we are, I know that there are some investments taking place that are a little bit higher up the value chain, but uh, what, what's your view on how do we make best use of the BPO sector um, to, to enhance the use of digital, not just uh, as, as a, a conduit for, for servicing transactions outside of Jamaica, but for our own digital literacy um, as, a, as a country. And you know, conduit is the name of <laughs> one of the BPOs here in yes, Jamaica. Yes. But, um, you know, as I said, when I look at the trend of work from home, I believe that's going to be permanent. Um, there, as I said, there are companies now advertising and giving persons the option of working from home and not having to come into a physical location. Mm -hmm. And I believe that gives people more of an opportunity, depending on their skill set, to offer beyond just you know, the customer service type um, activities. But you can only move up the value chain if you have trained, qualified, skilled persons in the area. 
it doesn't happen by chance. And, and so you have to make the investment in um, training people in those areas that you know may be in demand. You know, nobody, I, I can vividly remember my time at Jampro, I think we had a query from Infosys out of right. India who, you know, they were scouting around seeing if Jamaica was possibly a location for software development. And they said, would you be able to get us 300 software developers? And we couldn't. Right. We wouldn't be able to find them. Yeah. I don't know if we would be able to find them right now either. Not that there aren't 300 software developers in Jamaica, but readily who would be able to work in a company. I don't know if we would. Right. So, you know, we, we talk about the value chain a lot moving up, but we have to make the investment now in educating persons to be in a position to take advantage of the opportunities mm -hmm. and to attract the kind of investment. But the, the BPO also provides the opportunity for the government to, you know, government is putting in public Wi-Fi hotspots using community centers. These are opportunities for people to use these places to, to, to upgrade their own skills, use the computer labs to learn new ways of working and put them in a position where they can earn and work from where they are. Right. So I view you know, the pandemic as also providing opportunities for many of, of persons who may not have had jobs before to pivot to an environment where digital becomes more and more prevalent and more the mainstay in how we operate. Right. Uh, so for, uh, I'm, I'm going to borrow your, your management consulting hat for a little bit um, and uh, ask you to, to, to help our audience do a little forecasting. Um, the, the Caribbean has some specific circumstances around how, how businesses are operating here and, this, and we are so tourism dependent as well. Um, if from, from just looking at the, the state of the economy, the, the state of what COVID has, has caused, but also the, the general move towards greater adoption of digital, whether that is payment, whether that is teleconferencing, whether that is collaborative tools, uh, forecasts for, for our business audience. So where, where do you see the greatest opportunities in the Caribbean? Um, and uh, and where where do you think Caribbean um, entrepreneurs should be looking at and, and seeking, if, if, especially if they want to be be um, affecting uh, the or economy in the in the same or purpose way that this conference is built around? How how do small businesses make the investment um, in in a in a purpose driven way to ensure impact? Uh, for, for the wider Caribbean? I mean, I think the, there are major opportunities for our economy, particularly in manufacturing and in agribusiness. And even if you take the tourism sector as one example, we spend a billion US dollars importing food, principally for the tourism industry. You won't be able to substitute that totally, but clearly there's an opportunity for more locally based produce in our tourism industry, which would provide abuse to agriculture and also manufacturing. There are a lot of goods that we produce here, and I'm using Jamaica as an example, which we have not just a diaspora abroad that would want those goods, but you have a bigger audience, particularly in North America and in the Americas region that I believe the opportunities exist for. But if I get specific to what I believe our immediate growth areas for, for small businesses as digital becomes more prevalent. The issue of cybersecurity is paramount because more and more persons are going to be doing transactions online. More and more businesses are going online. We are launching a digital currency. We are launching uh, a digital ID as in NIDS. More and more countries are doing that. And businesses will have to protect themselves to a great extent than they did before, because more of their interface with their customers will be online. Secondly, the providing, whether it be 
um, software development, user interface, all of those types of services are going to become more important. So as opposed to a branch, a physical branch, and you have an interior designer, you're gonna have a digital branch as a financial institution. And so you need individuals with that kind of a skill set to help companies to navigate this space. And the good thing about the space being virtual is that your audience is not confined to your local geography. Your audience can be anywhere in the world. And so it gives you an opportunity to also position and market yourselves to a bigger audience. So for me, I think um, the digital, the move to more digital, there are a variety of not, um, services which are connected to being online that I believe small businesses and entrepreneurs can position themselves to take advantage of. Because as I said, I don't see many of the businesses going back to the heavy reliance on the physical setup that physical branches, facilities that they had prior to COVID. They're simply not gonna do it. You know, we we are we have taken steps where you know our social security program care was delivered online, not by our cash or not by our checks, which is the way to go. So again, more and more services are going to be consumed online and persons are going to be forced. If, even if they're not comfortable with being online to do it online, which I believe is uh, an important way because you need to reduce transaction costs as a government. You need to deliver services more efficiently and effectively like tax office services, renewing driver's license, paying property and other kinds of taxes. So uh, it, it, I don't want to interrupt you, but it, it brings, sure. as you mentioned the tax office, it actually leads into my, my final question. So yeah. it might be good to, to ask that question and have you address um, the, the tax office. A lot of, of small business owners are, are, are complaining that, um, look, the, the, the tax office is, is, is too analog. Um, the, the type of digital transformation that needs to take place in, in the collection of uh, revenue uh, is not happening. And the, the type of innovation um, in that space um, to allow people to, for example, pay for their driver's license online directly uh, is, is not taking place fast enough. I know that there have been some, some moves by the, the, the revenue authorities to ensure payments of tickets and all of that. But um, I, I, there's a lot of complaints around the need to move uh, faster where that is concerned. Um, don't do, I, and I, again, we acknowledge where, your, your, your port, where you are now, you're not um, the Minister of Finance, but what is your, your overall view on the efficiency of the public service and ensuring that more businesses, more uh, individuals can, can pay for services um, through, through, the, um, through digital? Well, from, I would say the tax office has made some strides, but clearly it's not good enough. I mean, for example, I, I pay all my property taxes online. I, I was able to pay a traffic ticket online. Um, but there are still other routine things, and I, I haven't done it yet, but I saw where they have also introduced renewing your driver's license online. I saw where PICA, or Passport Agency, allows you to do a renewal online as well. I haven't tried it myself. So I think there are some strides that have been made, and I think when the electronic ID comes on board, it will facilitate more of these transactions being online. Um, it, it still is very tedious and, you know, over, you know, the COVID period, we would see, you know, lines of people always at tax offices waiting to do basic transactions. And I believe there is more that needs to be done and more quickly. But I think I would acknowledge that they have made a start and they have made some strides and we just need to keep pushing them to to get more of their services online. Thank you so much, um, Julian Robinson, uh, Member of Parliament and uh, uh, Shadow Spokesperson on Finance uh, and 
really, really happy to have you here, Julian, and to get your perspective on how the Caribbean economies navigate uh, the, the shocks that, that is going through. Uh, thank you so much for, for Thank you for the us. opportunity. Um, um, good luck for the rest of your seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you.